Hello, folks. You'll all recognise that one now. Well, you're as the bloke. Yep. One of the most recognisable faces in English history. And, you know, we all get it straight away, don't we? You know, the bow tie, the bulldog look, and the great name. Yep, Winston Churchill. Now, this isn't the Churchill of the finest hour of Yalta of 1940. All right? This is the coda, the diminuendo. If the 30s were the wilderness years, there's an argument for saying the period we're going to be looking at were actually the somewhat pointless years. That's unkind. And to be honest, I'd take the somewhat pointless Churchill over quite a few recent incumbents. For all that, I must admit, I have a soft spot for Churchill. It's in part because of this thing, this book here. This is the first serious history book I ever read. It belonged, it's written by Henry Pelling, published in 1974. And this is my granddad's copy. I've inherited it. It's slightly battered now, a couple of pages loose in it. And to be fair, it's not Pelling's greatest book by a long chalk. He wrote many, many finer books than this. But... In 1974, I was a young boy, reading this, there's something about a kind of slightly wayward, slightly adventurous, um, slightly gormless boy who was rubbish at most things at school, but loved history, that kind of appealed. And so did, of course, the idea that that person was a great man of destiny. So I got half of it anyway, didn't I? That's Churchill, guys. I'm going to look at the Churchill, not of here, but the Churchill of his later years. The Churchill of 1951 to 55. Now, not surprisingly, these are the least well-known of his years of his public life, because they're frankly the least exciting. Um, you'll all know his famous quip about history being unkind to some, but kind to him, because he would write it. Well, the truth is, he never did write these years. These years never got a gathering storm or finest hour, two of the great volumes of his war memoirs. Pelling wrote about them, but actually he wrote about them in his declining years as well. So there's something, again, even as historians, that's been a bit of a diminuendo, a history past its prime in every sense. Churchill was actually what we call a Whig historian. Now, a kind of Whig history was a kind of view of history, very British view of history, the Whig as in W-H-I-G, you know, um, 19th century political, political party. But the idea was that Britain's the course of British history was its progress towards Britain's greatness, parliamentary democracy, and one suspects in Churchill's case, Winston Churchill. Never a man to underestimate himself, I think it's fair to say, though actually one quite insecure about his way people viewed him, which is quite an interesting combination, I think. Churchill did write a weird history in his retirement, funnily enough, um, which is called A History of the English-Speaking Peoples. It comes in four parts. I actually think it's the weakest of his history books, or four of his weakest history books. In part, um, I think he was less interested in it by this stage. It's partly a lot of it, the graft was done, it was done by some other people. It just doesn't seem to have the same sort of grip that he had. Churchill often had with the figures in it. Churchill was a great writer of sort of people, and it just doesn't seem to have that same thing. In trying to praise it, fully enough, um, you know, Jack Plum famously said, well, what this book really was a representation of what people's of Churchill's generation once thought about our history. It's certainly sort of doubly out of date. Interestingly, the book ends around 1900, just as Churchill comes on the scene to kind of reinforce my previous point. When he returned to office, the problem was that the great man himself, a bit like the history he would write just after, was kind of past its sell-by date. He was 76 in 1951, though that's not ancient at all, really necessarily, and nowadays it's just about prime age for being a presidential candidate for the Democrats, isn't it? You know, oh well. Um, as I could say about Chamberlain, we'll go on to say about Eden, being an old man in a hurry in politics could be a dangerous thing, but there was nothing to worry about in this case, therefore, because the last thing Churchill would be was an old man in a hurry. At 76, he certainly wasn't the oldest man to assume office in Downing Street. Um, Palmerston was older than that when he was last in office. Gladstone actually took office aged 80. But there in lies kind of the rub, because you see, when Gladstone took office in 1892, in the last four years, or two years really, isn't it? Yeah, he had as Prime Minister, it was a kind of well, a poor, not very good imitation of what he'd been when he'd been the great, the people's William, back in the 1860s, 70s and 80s. You know, the truth is, 
it was too late for him. All the other septuagenarians, you know, people over 70 who'd held the job of prime minister, did so in what we might think of as the Victorian age, or in Salisbury, just slightly beyond, because he just outlasts the Queen by a little period. The key is the job of 19th century prime minister was a very different animal to that of a 20th century one. There was far less work involved, far less time spent in committees, far less time spent in cabinet, far less time spent dealing with paper. There was no such thing as a cabinet office, any of that formal stuff. Really, it was a kind of amiable chairman who did as much as he needed to and could actually get away with quite often just letting other people do much of the work. The job of a 20th century prime minister is far greater. Seeing Churchill in his final years, I think in some ways, is a bit like going to see the Rolling Stones now. Right. Um, you kind of want to see it because, you know, you're not probably not going to get to see him again many times, if at all. And you kind of therefore may overlook the bits where you say, oh, well, I mean, they're old or this isn't as good as it used to be. When you think to yourself, well, this ain't them doing Jumping Jack Flash in 1968. You know, this is uh, slightly different. But in truth, what do you get? You get the greatest hits and some old guys doing a tribute act as a kind of imitation to the great figures they once were. That's Churchill. The same was true, by the way, I think, of Churchill. Um, looking back, he was trying to recapture something, I think, like these old men are, you know. Defeat really hit him hard in 45. When Clemmy, his wife, famously says, well, it might be a blessing in disguise, dear. He said, if so, it's bloody well disguised. And it was a joke, but there was a barb to that joke. A sense of loss, I think. When Labour won in 1950, he again quipped, well, those bastards can stay in for as long as they want to now. But there was a barb to that as well. And actually, you know, a sense of impatience. Now, I think if Labour had won big in 1950, that would have been it for Churchill. He would have gone. But because it was so close, there was only a five-seat majority, he recognised there could well be another election soon and he would have his last shot at greatness. But the other thing, you see, Churchill had never actually won an election as Prime Minister. He took office in 1940, got stuffed in 1945. He'd lost in 50 again. I think part of him just wanted one little chance for affirmation from the public for the people's will him now to be succeeded by the people's Winston. Then there was another thing. Churchill had had a mild stroke in 49, I think it was, certainly before the 50 election. He'd actually campaigned with great vigour in 1950, but I think that intimation of mortality as well made him think, I want to get one last grasp, if you like, of the history that he was so fond of writing for himself. And anyway, when he comes to Prime Minister, I think most of his colleagues, you know, the Edens, Macmillans, etc., kind of hope what's going to happen is he can enjoy, you know, get the gig, thank you very much, wave, thank you, bye, I've done a great thing, I'm a great Winston, I've done myself, and after a short while, gently retire and head into the sunset. Mm. Misjudged it there, didn't they? Going quietly into the sunset isn't exactly Churchillian, I think. In any case, once he gets back into number 10, he's enjoying himself. But, well, like a tribute act... He gets the old band together as much as he can. There are some familiar names. Eden's back at the Foreign Office. He had to do that, I think. You know, Eden's very much his heir apparent. But other names that you probably won't have heard of that he was particularly attached to, names like Monkton, Churwell, the wonderfully known Pug Ismay, all make comebacks, arguably pretty much past their dates as well. And overlords, something George was very fond of overlords. It sounds to Chilean, doesn't it? Yeah, to kind of oversee the runnings of government in group areas were also a thing Churchill very much returned to, something he'd been fond of during the war. The problem was this time, quite often nobody was quite sure who the overlords were or what they were overlords of. And competencies cross over, as so often does happen. Churchill was also what Peter Hennessy calls a natural coalitionist, and I like that phrase about him. Remember, he started as a Conservative, switched to the Liberals, He'd been one of those liberals sympathetic to the idea of coalition from even before the First World War. He was then Lloyd George coalition liberal, and he was then a conservative, and he was then the leader of a coalition government. When he stood to form his government in 1951, he makes serious overtones to liberals. I mean, already, for example, his home secretary is actually Gwilym Lloyd George. Now, Gwilym Lloyd George was now a conservative, but, you know, came from the liberal hinterland and was son of the great David Lloyd George, so that's a kind of liberal. He approached the liberal leader, Clement Davis, and actually came pretty close to offering him education. Davis turned him down. He asked Cyril Asquith, who's Asquith's um, son, to become Lord Chancellor. 
He even campaigned alongside Lady Violet Bonham Carter, Asquith's daughter, even though she was actually a liberal. In some ways, what we have here is a government of what Pete Hennessy, again, we'll keep quoting him tonight, yet, calls a government of national nostalgia. Um, and again, this tribute act thing comes in. I've got to read a bit of Roy Jenkins again. My great biography of Churchill, Roy Jenkins, I think the best biography of him. The most vivid moments of the second premiership were in the bustle of returning to office, putting together a government, summoning officials, recreating his staff, sending or acknowledging greetings all over the world. It was at least as much a pageant to commemorate the great days of the first government as it was a realistic preparation for a new period of office. Churchill didn't have much interest in domestic matters, even less than he had only his government the first time. And much of the cabinet's domestic business was chaired elsewhere, very competently right by Rab Butler. A lot of the political league was taken by Eden when he was well enough, but Eden was quite often ill during these years of becoming increasingly crabby and difficult as well, as we'll discuss. Churchill was primarily interested in foreign affairs. I mean, there was foreign affairs to be interested in, and plenty of them, and Korea was grinding on. More importantly for Churchill, I think, was to he viewed the prospects of a nuclear conflagration, you know, of an actual nuclear war, with real and genuine fear and dismay. As such, he was attached to one last great idea, if you like, what he, I think he thought to himself would be his last great moment, and that was the return of Summitry, his last place in the history books. Summitry? Well, you know, Yalta, Potsdam. But the problem was, to keep the analogy going, this was an old hit, and the world had moved on. The days of Yalta and Potsdam writing naughty documents on napkins dividing up Europe to him and Stalin after dinner, they were long gone. For a start, Stalin was now old, would die soon, and had reverted to type. Anti-capitalism, the imperialist West, campaigns of terror, scaring the life out of his Politburo, or actually taking the life of his Politburo in a few cases, and Truman's days in the White House were nearly up as well. It was the election due in '52. Most of all, though, the world had moved on. This was now a bipolar world. Yet Britain was very much the third power, and that means third quite well down. Not perhaps the third world, third power that had originally been a you know, much diminished force. The year after Churchill leaves office, Suez would illustrate that with a kind of brutal, brutal, forceful status. In truth, there's a sense of drift to policy in these years. There were some big initiatives. The Treasury tried to right the economy. They said, what we're going to do, we're going to float sterling rather than keep it on the fixed exchange rate of Bretton Woods. And when we floated sterling, we're going to use that to force a measure of um, deflation and financial stringency. And they nicknamed it robot, funnily enough, after the officials who created it. It was rejected. Only Macmillan, I think, of all the ministers in this administration really shone. The others are kind of like half-hearted, watery evenings, sun, sunshine, which kind of fits the general mood of the government. In 53, Churchill had another stroke. This one was much more serious than the first one and looked as if it was going to kill him at one point. His powers of concentration and his sense of grip, to be honest, had never been the same anyway when he came back to power in 51. But Miller noted that, you know, either side of the stroke, he both, he more than once made representations about his concern about Churchill as Prime Minister, if you like, Churchill's grip on government. By the time the second stroke has come, that lack of grip is pretty evident to everyone. The trouble is no one was willing to wield the knife. Now, the most impatient knife wielder to be was Eden, but Eden had you know, built his reputation on loyalty to Churchill. And if Eden was going to succeed him, he couldn't really be seen to be the one wielding the knife, maybe, as well. The problem was that Eden was one of the reasons Churchill was clinging on. Eden was also one of the reasons why nobody else was willing to wield the knife. I think by 1954, many of Eden's colleagues had come round to the idea that actually Eden was not really fit for the job he was about to inherit. The problem was no one could think of a way of stopping him. So, for the time being, the old fella kept buggering on while everyone secretly began to try and think of ways of getting him to bugger off. In the end, Churchill kind of did for himself a little bit by doing a Lloyd George, actually, fittingly enough there. That fits it quite well, doesn't it? A kind of Chanak 
If you remember Chanak, this was where Lloyd George in 1922, already a kind of alienated from a lot of his conservative colleagues, intervened personally to try and sort of stop the Turks taking the British base at Chanak in Turkey, and nearly provoked a war. In doing so, he turned Bonner Law, who had been his close colleague, who was now out of government against him, turned quite a few curs and his foreign secretary against him. And in the end, it's one of the reasons why Lloyd George gets the boot at the Carlton Club in October 22. Well, remember I said earlier that the last thing Churchill was was an old man in a hurry. Well, I meant that literally, because it was the last thing he actually was, politically speaking. In 1954, he'd gone to meet Eisenhower. And I think Eisenhower was kind of nagged, basically, into agreeing that Churchill could try and see if he could bring about some kind of summitry with the Soviets, maybe even Churchill himself going to Moscow. Churchill grasped that, because he saw that, as here it is, the great moment. I can pluck the arms from the fire. Stalin's dead. There's a new leadership in Moscow. This can be my last great place in the history books. And in doing so, in a burst of ebullient energy, reminiscent of the Churchill of 1940... He fired off a telegram to Moscow. It was a pretty pointless telegram, by the way, because the Politburo in Moscow were busy trying to outmaneuver each other to succeed Stalin. It took a couple of years before Khrushchev was the clear leader, and they were all far too busy spiking each other to do any worry about Churchill's summit. But the point was, he'd fired the telegram off without consulting his cabinet, or indeed his foreign secretary. This was a kind of Chanak League sequel. Churchill had acted without any consultation. There's no Carlton Club this time. There's no big meeting of backbenchers saying Winston must go. I don't think they'd have done that. Instead, this was a bit more reminiscent of the way Thatcher would be booted out in 1990. In this case, there were some private words we think. We think Butler took some of the initiative in this. But, Miller maybe a little bit as well. But what there was was a cabinet meeting. Now, this is pretty brutal. Yeah, one after another, Churchill's colleagues basically said to him, Winston, you're done for. Yeah, so none of you heard of Bobby Cecil, yet you will. But you've all heard of Macmillan, Butler, Eden. Yeah, I mean, Eden, you know, his close colleague since, well, 1937, it's even before he was in government. You know, Eden telling him he had to go. Now, it wasn't done like Thatcher, where, you know, it's the brutality of done overnight. And he was given a gracious exit. It was actually not until 1955 that he left office and, you know, did so after seeing the Queen, etc. You know, but the truth is, just the same as the others, Churchill was booted out of office. Now, one little point to make about this is that it didn't have the seismic political effect, Churchill being booted out of office, that Lloyd George being booted out, or indeed Thatcher would. And my argument is the, the two great bootings out of office in terms of their importance in modern British political history were... Lloyd George and Thatcher, both lead, I think, to major political configurations, reconfigurations, one of which we're still dealing with, by the way. But what Churchill's kind of represents is something slightly different. To me, it's almost like the end of an era. I mean, the truth is, you know, even in the war, Churchill looked as if he was something from another era, really. His language sounded quite Edwardian, sounded quite old-fashioned. He was rubbish on radio, you may not realise, but it's true he was. The, you know, the great versions of his speeches were in 1949 Greatest Hits compilation. You know, there are re-recording re, re of them. In truth, Churchill, by now, looked like almost the embodiment of the old England. Two years before the king had died. 1953 was the coronation, the new queen. 54, Churchill, 55, sorry, Churchill leaves office. It seemed like the end of, in one sense, an old English era. Of course, actually, you could argue that it happens the following year, rather more brutally, of Suez, which is really perhaps the end of that era of English history, of British imperial history, if you like. The fact is that Churchill, by the time he went, was due to go. And his departure was, well, frankly, greeted with relief by his colleagues. But relief, at least, until they realised quite how bad Eden was going to be. Enoch Powell. Famously, you've heard this, say this dictum before, some of you. All political careers end in failure. Well, yeah, Churchill's did it away, but, you know, it was a kind of more a sort of gradual decline, I think. Even... In his years in office, last years in office, though, there was something you know, almost remarkable about the figure of him. Yeah, that is in part inherited memory, because people remember the Churchill of the First World, the Second World War, you know, the great man, etc. 
but nonetheless, there was still something of that about him. And you know, his departure from office symbolises, I think, well, <laughs> something of a moment in English history, you know, departure of one of the great, great names. Well, you know, I'm a Churchill fan, but you also know, of course, Clement Attlee, the man. Well, Attlee, who was one of the most gracious of our politicians, famously said upon Churchill's death that Churchill was undoubtedly the greatest Englishman of his time and, in fact, the greatest citizen of the world of his time. This may have been not that Churchill, but it was still Churchill.